Ai. Good morning. I'm going to ask Mr. Williams if he'll open us in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting, thou art eternal God. We thank you for this another day. We thank you for the opportunity. We ask a special blessing upon the chairman and the members of this committee. We ask our Father that you keep our hearts correct and our minds on you. Lord, we will be forever grateful. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, well, remember how it is. Brevity is, oh, Lord, and I've got Paul first. <laughs> Mr. Battles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> uh, top of the page, open rules, House, House uh, Bill 292. It is, uh, does have a substitute, and that is uh, LC 212248S. Uh, what this bill does, it revises the benefit calculation for the magistrate average final annual compensations for members of the Magistrate Fund of Georgia. Under this bill, the maximum average final monthly compensation would be based on the population of the county in which the member serves. And if there's any other, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to address them. No, no questions, we're afraid to ask any. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your consideration. Mr. Teasley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I um, come here to ask for House Bill 920, um, came out of insurance. Uh, the short, short story is in the past, insurance and annuity companies, life insurance and annuity companies who had um, been accessing the death master file, which is a database the Social, Social Security Administration keeps on um, those who passed away. Some companies had been using this only to um, make sure they stopped paying annuities and were not using it to make sure they were paying out life insurance claims. And so what this bill says is going forward after all policies um, issued or renewed on January 1st, 2015, that um, all policies will have to access the death master file. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hitchens. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, on the back page, about halfway down on the modified structure rule, House Bill 783. Uh, simply stated, this bill is to correct an error that was made last year in the voting under the influence bill. It deals with implied consent. But they inadvertently changed the implied consent for hunting under the influence. All this does is put it back like it was and where it's reflected in two other places in the code already. So we have two places in the code where it says one thing and this new one says something else. We want to make it like it was. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Caldwell. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, first page, House Resolution 1161. This is committee substitute. What this does change is one word or one number, whichever way you want to put it, Mr. Chairman. In the Constitution, it says that the district attorney shall be a member of the state bar for three years before they can be a DA. This changes it to seven. That's all it says, but it takes a constitutional amendment. And if you're in office already and don't have that three uh, seven years, you stay in office. That's all it does. And it's re requested by the DA's association and the prosecuting attorney's council. No questions. Thank you. Sir? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Hawkins. Um. <laughs> House Bill 943, back page, third from the bottom, modified structure. 
Uh, this bill calls for parity of, of covering oral chemotherapy with IV chemotherapy. Many of these drugs cost the very same. The wholesale costs are the same. But if you go to the hospital where, where uh, your insurance covers it on the hospital portion of your health care, you'll pay a 20 30 percent copay or twenty thirty dollar copay. If you go to the pharmacy, you're going to pay a twenty to thirty percent uh, co-insurance for the same drug. One being IV costs you twenty thirty dollars. The oral form it may cost you two to three thousand dollars. This asks the, uh, for parity within these uh, two ways of insurance coverage. Uh, if you notice on the second page of the bill, it does. Uh, uh, there is a deductible, all coinsurance, adding up to no more than two hundred dollars per field script. No questions. questions. Thank you, Mr. Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a substitute uh, HB 495 LC. 400518S. Basically, what wait, this wait, allows. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. All right. In state properties, if we have property that needs to be sold, it takes an average of 520 to 580 days. What we're trying to do is look at a couple things. This bill allows for state property commission chaired by the governor and including a member appointed by the Speaker of the House and the Lieutenant Governor to approve conveyances to real estate property for $500,000 or less. If it's $100,000 or less, we have one appraisal. On that appraisal, we pretty much runs about $4,000. If it's $100,000 to $500,000, we have two appraisals. They are brought before this board. Now, on doing this, we're not taking the complete power away from legislators, and I want you to understand that. One of the things we're doing is we're going to allow uh, the legislation, if it's in your district with this property, you'll in 30 days have a certified letter sent to you to appeal. If you just write, a, I'm against it, it will veto that piece of property. It comes back before our legislation season. So it's not here to try to take us out of anything. It's to try to speed up properties that are laying around for two years, basically, with investors trying to buy this property. HB 495. Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'm trying to look through it, and I can't. Could you <coughs> tell me where that is in the bill that talks about that we have the veto power? Yes, sir. We, we basically changed that to make sure in the district it is uh, lines 202 and 203. We wanted to make sure we kept that there to where we did not take it out of our hands. But if there's property that's sitting here and not on the tax digest, we have that option of bringing it back and at least receiving some money. If I'm going to buy property, 100 days is a lot better for me to invest over 500 plus. Boy, thank you. <laughs> thank <Bye>. you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first bill under modified open rule, page one, House Bill 423. This will allow the use of live raccoons for sanctioned field trials, and those field trials will be uh, overseen, and the rules and regulations for such trials will be overseen by the Department of Natural Resources. Any questions? This is done in other states, correct? It is done in other states. Okay. Thank you. Uh -oh. Mr. Lindsay. I was just wondering, oftentimes, in order to uh, present a bill, to give it effect, it's sometimes important not just to argue for it in the well, but to also have uh, some kind of demonstration. And I was wondering whether or not we could get a demonstration of this practice on the floor of the House when you present the bill. I will certainly take that under advisement, Mr. Lindsay and work to find a demonstration for you. Or feel free to come to my district on Saturday. I'm sure we'll find someone who, uh, who can give you a detailed explanation. No, 
don't think they do field trials in Buckhead. <laughs> Got to be the life of the party. Shouldn't they use coons in field trials? What, 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 what part of this have y'all got confused with that you've got to press your daggum button and speak and then just start speaking? Mr. Peak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we were just one over here. Does this, would this not apply to like dead raccoons or? It's battery operated like raccoons. It just has to be live raccoon. I imagine the the purpose of live raccoon obviously is to is to allow the dog to track a, a live scent. And uh, obviously the the raccoons are encased. They're safe. They're put up in a tree, and then they're released after the trial. But thank you for the question. We have to pay for the therapy. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pizzo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, House Bill 778, modified open, dead center of the first page. This bill makes it easier to donate food to nonprofits by allowing donor liability only in cases of gross negligence. Y'all bear with me a minute. Any questions of Mr. Pizzo? No questions, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Maybrook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Middle of the page, modified open rule, House Bill 828. This is a bill to stop ambulance chasing, to stop attorneys and doctors from using runners to contact victims of car wrecks to get them into their office so they can represent them or to treat them. No questions, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Long time on Lanky. Let's go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member of the committee. Uh, under modified structured on the back page, HB 910 uh, would create a recognition uh, process for medical legal partnerships through the Department of Community Health. Medical legal partnerships are joint voluntary collaborations between healthcare professionals and legal professionals uh, in the private sector aimed at providing uh, more effective uh, healthcare treatment for our patients. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barr. Mr. Chairman, thank you, sir. This is a modified open 490. This is the library bill. This, uh, is requested by unanimous support of the Georgia Council of Libraries and ACCG, bringing into parity uh, the uh, county library employees with the rest of the county employees. Any questions? Thank you. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I bring before you HB 436. It's the second bill listed under the modified open on your page. It simply would allow for durational residence requirements for county and municipal elections. You getting tired of coming up here? Sir, I'll come back as many times as you need me to come back. No questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. He had the right answer in case y'all wanted to know what the answer is. <laughs> Mr. Carson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, uh, back page under structured rule, House Bill 153. This allows Georgia counties to propose a splice rate at less than 1%. We've worked out language with the uh, Department of Revenue to make sure it's not just any fraction, but uh, in basically increments of 1 20th percent. We've also included uh, uh, 
that counties and municipalities and their municipalities can enact as SPLOS within 45 days of certifying the results so that they, might, they could do an election uh, in the general election in November if they wanted to do a November 1st effective uh, SPLOS. This also includes language to make sure that uh, if a county does want to do, obviously we recommend IGAs, intergovernmental agreements, for almost all SPLOS, but this has a particular stipulation based on requests from GMA that if a county does do a, a SPLOS at less than 1%, all municipalities, not just the majority, but all municipalities must sign off on that with an IGA. Mr. Well, no, Mr. Sessler. Representative Carson, uh, isn't it true that you have worked tirelessly for two years with local government organizations, Department of Revenue, to craft this bill, um, and I, I, I just think with, with all the work you put into it and the, the consensus you've been able to build, this is this is really takes this issue to a level that's not been addressed in the past, and I, I commend you for your efforts. Um, I appreciate those sentiments. Uh, we have worked. Uh, it's been more of a team effort, as you know, and I appreciate your support and help with it. Um, we've worked with ACC, GMA, Georgia Retailers, Department of Revenue, uh, numerous entities all over the state. No more questions. Thank you. Mr. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. If the chairman allows, I'd like to ask you about two bills this morning. The first one is on your first page under modified open. House Bill 670, House Bill 670. Mr. Chairman, this is the um, bill that allows trade names, allows our clerks, of course, to put trade names online so citizens can go, not have to go to the courthouse, but through electronic format view our trade name registries. This is a long line that we're completing of almost now all the records in the courthouse. If we pass this, we'll be online. We did deeds in the past and UCCs doing this in the same format where there's a $5 fee that you pay when you file your trade name and that allows them to bring the system up. Any questions? Next bill. Mr. Chairman, the, the, on the second page, under modified structure rule, House Bill 891, toward the middle, 891. Mr. Chairman, this is the bill which is, comes at the request of the Georgia Municipal Association to allow cities to have one week of early voting and a Saturday rather than the three weeks which is currently required by law. We already treat cities differently in that they are nonpartisan races. They happen in odd year, not even years when all the other elections occur. Like I said, this is a very um, strong request from our local governments to help them save some money uh, and uh, that's basically what it does. Questions? Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Fleming, under the terms of the bill, does it not mandate that all cities have to comply with a week? And it does, is it not true that cities that wish to have longer than one week for early voting are not allowed to do so? That is correct. This would make it uniform across the state. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative, I've been torn about uh, this, this issue, um, in particular dealing with extending uh, or allowing local governments to extend um, out of, for a longer period of time early voting. My initial reaction was to favor giving the discretion to the municipalities. However, yesterday I spoke with uh, someone in my community in regards to the concerns about down ballot races, uh, due, particularly with city council races, in which usually candidates have a limited amount of funds and they've got to marshal it to be able to get their message out very close to the election. And their concern was by extending early voting out five or six weeks, you were oftentimes having voters go to the ballot uh, to vote early uh, before they have any real knowledge as to what's going on in a particular race. Uh, they wanted to make sure that we were instead uh, allowing for uh, more time closer to the election uh, for uh, folks to vote on Saturday, for instance. For instance, does this allow for Saturday voting closer to the election? Y yes, sir, it does. It, in fact, voting would start on a Saturday, then you have a whole week of early voting, and then you close down the weekend like we do in the current law, and then you have your Tuesday voting on, on Election Day. Also, of course, it does nothing to affect the 45 or so days you have to vote absentee ballot, which, of course, is one of the most liberal in the nation that we have here in Georgia and is very effective. Let anybody vote very early if they want to. 
Ms. Abrams. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, in light of uh, Representative Lindsay's question, uh, is it not true that current law only allows up to three weeks of early voting for any, organ for any city, county, or municipal election? Uh, th that is correct. And is it not further true that uh, should there be, uh, let's say, a freak snowstorm uh, that could shut down and immobilize the city for up to a week under the provisions of this law for a city of the size that has approximately 400,000 uh, residents, that there is no provision in our law to allow early voting to occur at any other time at that one week period under the current terms of this law? Well, I would disagree with the minority leader's characterization of that because, as she is aware, we do have a ju judicial relief valve. You are aware in this state that judges can order polls to be kept open longer if deemed necessary because of some natural disaster. And if something occurred to that extent and the city government thought that they needed more time, they could always go to the court and ask for some relief. But under the terms of the law, it would not, it would have to, you would have to actually go to the courts to seek a longer period of time. We would not leave it to the discretion of the legis We could not provide for an earlier period of time that would allow the three weeks that they currently enjoy to continue to be extended. Uh, the minority leader, I believe, is correct in that, but I also would comment that this changes nothing about the current law. Right now, local governments don't have the option to do what you're saying unless they go to a judge and ask for extended time in extended circumstances. Just, just to clarify, are you saying that under current law, cities do not have a three-week voting period? No, ma'am. We'd settle that with your first question. They do. This would change it to one week. I'm talking about if something unexpected came up, as you had mentioned, they still have that judicial relief valve. And my point was that currently they can't on their own make that decision if something comes up. Even with the three weeks, they still have to go to the court and ask for relief. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Lindsay. Just a quick question. Uh, while we have seen some occasional early uh, freak snowstorms, do you recall any time in the history of Georgia that we've had a freak snowstorm in October? Well, uh, Mr. Lindsay, I, I do not. I'll tell you, being from the Augusta area, we had ice, down trees, we had earthquakes, and somebody told me if I see locusts, I'm out of here. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure about anything about that right now. Ms. Brotam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I, I don't have not studied this issue like you have. Do you? have any concern about the potential for voter confusion? Do, do you have any concern over uh, the possibility or maybe even the probability of voter confusion by having a patchwork of different links? I mean, it's one thing to even, you know, train voters that there would be two different links of uh, voter, early voter uh, period with county elections and statewide uh, in your state elections versus municipal. But then within municipal, you know, we have, I mean, certainly in the metropolitan area, we have cities that abut each other. People live in one city. They work in another city. I mean, is that a concern? Madam Pro Tem, very good question. And this was discussed significantly at the committee level in government affairs. And uh, I think your question really goes to the issue of uniformity. And um, there were some initial arguments against the bill from the opponents of it that we wouldn't have uniformity across the board between all our elections and having three weeks. However, GMA very aptly pointed out that the, through polling their members and talking to the cities who are requesting this, we treat cities differently already. We have them in an odd year. They're all nonpartisan. Uh, there aren't usually runoff systems. Uh, so as long as we're consistent in how we treat the cities, I feel that the concern of uh, lack of uniformity is not that important now. If we were to start picking and choosing and allowing some cities to go three weeks and some to go one week, particularly in a metropolitan area like Atlanta where you got Sandy Springs just north of here and you got cities south of here, I, that I would think might cause some confusion. But as long as we treat them all alike, I think we're in pretty good shape. Your turnouts are historically lower uh, in city elections. Uh, when I was trying to work on this bill and after committee hearings in October and the issue came up, I went back home and the front page of the Augusta Chronicle was early voting turnout low when they were talking about a local city election. So the one week, I think, and it came out in the committee hearings, is very much ample time for our municipal governments and certainly the people that represent our local governments uh, being cities, GMA agrees. Ms. Abrams. And Mr. Chairman, I promise this is my final question. Good. <laughs> to, to the Speaker Pro Tem's point about uniformity, is it not true that the city of Columbus, the city of Savannah, the city of Athens are currently treated as counties for the purposes of municipal 
elections, and thus this will create nonconformity for the only other, for the only two large cities remaining, the cities of Augusta and the city of Atlanta. The city of Atlanta, not being in a consolidated government, would be treated differently than every other major metropolitan city, which will be allowed to continue their three-week election cycle, with the exception of the city of Augusta, which agreed, which has requested to be treated and treat it separately, but this would not provide the city of Atlanta the same courtesy we've given to every other large municipality to have an extended three-week early voting period. Well, I only agree with my learned minority leader partially in that if we pass this bill, the city of Atlanta would be treated like every other municipality in the state of Georgia, which I think that <laughs> uniformity is probably good. You do, however, point out correctly that some of our second-tier larger cities, Columbus, Augusta, uh, Moscow, uh, Macon, uh, Athens, they are all consolidated governments and one of the plums that we give to them to encourage those cities and counties to consolidate and hopefully save money is they can choose whether they want to be treated like a county or like a city. Uh, so in this instance, uh, you know, if you're consolidated you have a choice. If you're a city strictly, then we have the one week for you. Thank you, Mr. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Mr. Williamson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I come today to ask for your consideration under modified open rule, the fourth bill down, House Bill 610 by committee substitute, which clarifies uh, the licensing of public adjusters. Uh, and the legislation comes with the uh, full support of both the public adjusting community, the insurance community, and the Georgia Trial Bar. Happy to answer any questions. Mr. Gullett. Mr. Williamson, the bill uh, does have the support of the insurance department as well, correct? That is correct. Well, the, the, they're, they're, they're neutral on it, but they have no objection to it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, may I ask for another bill, please? Yep. All right, so the last bill, back of the uh, on back page, uh, structured rule, House Bill 816. Uh, this bill seeks to uh, fix an anom anomaly in our sales tax law. It comes with a um, blessing in, uh, in language provided by the Department of Revenue to remove, remove sales tax on postage. It's the only industry that uh, our printing industries are getting hit with sales tax on postage, and that's the only business uh, businesses in, in the, the nation that I'm aware of that are getting this unintended consequence of having to collect sales tax on postage. I ask for your favorable consideration. Thank you. Ms. Clark. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you so much. And I ask for your consideration of House Bill 834, which is under modified open, a little slightly below uh, halfway through the page. And um, this bill is a population bill that would repeal Georgia code. And uh, repealing this code would allow our counties um, who have uh, superseded the 800,000 mark, would allow them to function as they did before and allow them to have bond referendums, uh, referenda on any election cycle. And ladies and gentlemen, as you see, Mr. Chuck Sims' name is on this bill. And um, what happened was last year, as my chairman, he wanted to repeal all um, population bills and it could not uh, operate to finish that task. And so um, I asked him if he would please, out of consideration, please carry this bill for Gwinnett and Cobb. And um, he, uh, of course, um, said yes that he would. And now he has several projects underway and asked me to carry it the rest of the way. So he has placed his name second on this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Jones. Oh, who got a question? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I ask for your favorable consideration for HB 833 under open rule at the top of the first page. This rule, this bill changes the term of art from slum to blight for federal dollars. I have here uh, all of the HUD and CBDG uh, information showing that the correct term of art that's been used around the country is blight. I ask that uh, you give favorable consideration to this bill that has been co-sponsored by all of the members of the Douglas County House delegation.
Representative, Mr. Whip. Representative Jones, um, does this in any way modify a city's ability to exercise the power of eminent domain on blighted areas? We had a significant debate about that seven or eight years ago, and that was one of the issues we really drilled down on is abuses of using blight as the public purpose uh, that underlied a, a decision to exercise eminent domain. Does this in any way expand the city's ability to exercise that power? This absolutely does not change any effect in the law. The only thing that it changes is when a municipality decides that they want to use whatever the law allowed them to use before, that instead of saying you live in a slum, that you live in a blighted area, the term of art we wanted was opportunity zone, but that does not fit federal standards, but it changes nothing about how the law actually works. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Albers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I uh, come before again uh, under the modified structure rule for Senate Bill 207. Uh, I talked about this a little bit yesterday, but four simple words will help protect our senior citizens uh, and those receiving in-home health care. And I'd ask uh, for any questions or your favorable support. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Members. Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, bring before you uh, two bills. Uh, first bill is House Bill 830. No, I'm sorry. House Bill 804 on the first page under modified open. Georgia is one of the few states that requires a child between the age of 11 and 18 uh, to have to testify live in cases involving uh, where they've been the victims of sexual or physical abuse. This will simply give discretion to the judge to allow that testimony be done uh, remotely uh, by video. Can I have a question? Yes, sir. You're the, last time I checked, you, you're the chairman. You first stated right then, the, between the ages of 11 and 18. Yes, sir. And then I read here testimony of 10 or younger. The, the law as it presently exists does allow for remote testimony for children who are 10 and younger. What okay. this bill will do is increase that from the age of 10 to the age of 18 and giving the judge that discretion. Any questions? Next one. Second bill. Wait a second, Mr. Mr. Gold, Mr. No, no, okay. Second one. Second bill, Mr. Chairman, is HB 973. Uh, one of the most successful programs we've had in recent years in terms of recouping uh, from uh, entities that would defraud our Medicaid program is the Medicaid False Claims Act, which this body passed in 2008. It's led to the recovery of over $60 million in money that had been fraudulently. Uh, uh, taken through the Medicaid program. Uh, what this bill does is it keeps us in sync with the federal government, who's our partner in these deals. And if we remain in sync with them, we get an extra 10 percent bump uh, from funds that would otherwise go to the federal government we get to keep here in Georgia. That's assisted us with an additional $10 million over the last six years. Uh, what this bill simply does is keeps us in sync with the federal government, allows us to continue to get that 10 percent bump when we take the initiative to go after those in Georgia who defraud our Medicaid program. Questions? Mr. Golick, next. I do have one more. Just <laughs> all I'm going to do is ask. Um, at the request of my parish, which is very much involved in uh, Habitat for Humanity, I'd like to put my name by HB 750 and ask that this body consider bringing that to the floor. Are you done? Thank you. Mr. Go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Under modified structured uh, HB 863, this is a strengthening of our current animal cruelty laws and um, adding in a component regarding uh, the lack of uh, providing of adequate care. That goes to the issue of um, starvation. It also adds components to the aggravated felony, aggravated cruelty statute um, as it relates to uh, animal torture, poisoning. Uh, and other egregious acts. The compromise uh, that came out of the, uh, the committee reflects a consensus um, amongst uh, the prosecutors, prosecuting attorneys, counsel, um, the uh, sportsmen and hunting community, 
um, as well as uh, the Department of Agriculture has no objections or concerns regarding uh, the bill. The bill does not step on any existing regulations or definitions that they have. Um, I think it reflects a, a strengthening of the bill, but a common sense strengthening of the bill and uh, keeps community standards um, in place regarding um, the definitions of adequate care, which of course can be different in, in certain communities, perhaps in South Georgia and North Georgia, suburban metro as, as well. Be happy to answer any questions if there are. No questions. Thank you. Mr. Weldon. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to ask for House Bill 776. This is uh, the information bill that uh, Representative Atwood uh, is carrying, and uh, it's a good bill. Just ask, it's a cleanup bill for the uh, uh, rewrite of the. Uh, uh, jury selection process and also um, House Resolution 1161 which is a, uh, a bill being carried by Representative Caldwell and uh, it's a good bill that will help keep things squared away as far as district attorney qualifications. Thank you. Ms. Hughesley. Thank you Mr. Chairman. I'd like to place my name beside House Bill 833 House Bill 750 and House Bill 828, they're all three good measures. Mr. Setzler. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to urge the, cons com the committee's consideration for HB 153, the fractional local option sales tax. Mr. Williams. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mr. Chairman. And I'd place my name beside HB 833, definitely HB 223, HB 750, and HB 828. Do them again. <laughs> HB 833, okay. HB 223, HB 750, and HB 828. I'm, I'm missing. I'm missing one. Oh, the, the, the raccoon bill. Maybe I saw him running around here. 423. <laughs> okay. Any anyone else? Mr. Golick, have you got one for today? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pursuant to Rule 33.3, I would move that this committee uh, limit debate to no more than one hour time to be apportioned equally by the speaker for the following measures that are going to be debated today. SR 371, SB 206. HB 794 and HR 1215. You've had the motion. Do I hear a second? All those in favor signify by aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. So that will limit debate. That's on today's calendar. All right. We'll set Friday's calendar. Under modified structure, HB 783, any opposition? It's on. Under modified structure, HB 943, do you hear a motion? Any opposition? It's on. Under modified open, HR 1161. Any opposition? Under modified open, 
HB 834. Your motion. Any opposition? It's on. Under modified open, HB 670. Any opposition? Under modified open, HB 610. Any opposition? It's on. Under modified open, HB 436. Mr. Turner won't have to come back. It's on. And y'all have had such a good time with it. Modified open, HB 423. <laughs> I don't know. We're probably going to do a 15 minute limit on the debate. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's you for counter. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs>